for the moment Where I'm still in your presence All the noise dies down Lord, speak to me now You have all my attention I will linger and listen I can't miss a thing Cause Lord, I know my heart wants more of you My heart wants something new So I surrender Jesus, have you away in 
do I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else would do I just want you Well, hello, Hill City Church. It is so good to be with you today. Thanks so much for making Hill City part of your week. We are honored to be with you today. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm curious what the weather is where you are. Put yeah. it in the chat because it was calling for snow where we are. So yes. maybe it's snowing where you are. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's sunny. I know. But if it is snowing, make sure you get outside. These, I, I love it. I know you some people too. are like, do don't like snow. I, know. I love it. Hopefully you weren't kind of too badly impacted uh, with the snow over the past few weeks. So but. Matt, what's happening this week? Yes. Yeah, so this week we have students. Students is back. Now, now, students again is middle school and high school that's sixth grade to 12th grade and it's a gathering of all of us together where we are learning about God's Word but uh, also having a great time doing so we want to encourage you especially if you are a middle school or high school to reach out let us know so that we can give you all that information uh, you can also go to the website and check out information there we want to see you there it's gonna be absolutely a good time. as a yeah. parent of somebody who's in students you're gonna to want to make sure you're there because they love it also, beginning today, we want to invite you as our church into a 12-day fast. Yeah. And this is a time where we're really looking to really focus in, be intentional on spending time with God. Mm. And this can look a little bit differently, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of different options. And uh, you're going to kind of see kind of on social media and our website, different options that we're, we want to give Maybe to you. Maybe giving up food. Yeah, we want to give, one thing to give up is food. Another thing is kind of looking at your priorities in terms of social media, how you're spending your time, all those different things you can do. Uh, towards fasting towards God. Because ideally what we're trying to do is align our hearts with God's Absolutely. Hearts. That's the purpose, focusing yep. on Him. It's all about resetting our priorities. And so we hope that you join us over the next 12 days. So church, get ready for today's message as we continue in Psalms 23. Hey church, I'm so glad that you're carving out some time to gather with us together around God's word. I wanna invite you to come with me to the 23rd Psalm. Uh, we are carving out some space in the very beginning of our year, and we're walking through this passage of scripture together. Um, last week, um, we got a chance to unfold and unpack our word of the year. Uh, and our word of the year comes from the sixth verse uh, of this uh, passage of scripture, Psalm 23, verse six. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I just want to encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to uh, listen or be a part of that message yet, uh, press pause uh, on this sermon. Go back and listen to that one because I believe not only will it encourage you, um, but it's really the sort of foundation that we're moving through this passage of scripture with. Uh, and so we're going to start uh, at the very beginning of the passage now, uh, verse 1, 2, and 3 today. Uh, let's read them together. Uh, Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Let's bow our heads and our hearts for prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, for your goodness to us. So, Lord, we pray uh, in the next few moments, Lord, as we uh, dive into your word as we steady our hearts. God, I pray that your spirit that was present as this scripture was written and is also present now, uh, Lord, as we dive in and consider it. Lord, let that spirit uh, awaken us. Let it bring us to a place of understanding, a place of renewal, uh, and give us the courage now to be obedient to all of the things that you will say to us. God, we love you. We give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week was a great time uh, as we walked through that idea of goodness and mercy um, pursuing us. And I said this last week, and I, and I mean it wholeheartedly. I believe that as we unpack uh, each verse now uh, for the remainder of the month, as we walk through this passage, what I believe is it's going to even strengthen 
what we talked about last week, this idea of the goodness and mercy of God pursuing us and this being sort of a foundational word for us this year, us unpacking the full passage and getting to understand a little bit more about what is going on is only going to make it all the more um, stronger for us as we move through. And so as we look at this passage, what I, I want us to kind of keep in mind is, is David um, writes this psalm, and there's so much written about David. We, we could have a, a series on, on David, the life of David, and still not even be able to, uh, to for, like fully get through uh, all, all that David brings to the scriptures. But, but I want us to be reminded that David, before he was uh, King David, he was shepherd boy David. Before his address was uh, the palace, uh, he found himself often uh, in the pasture and he was caring for sheep. And so as he writes this passage, there is this sort of awareness and there's fondness, not just culturally from David uh, in regards to shepherding and being a shepherd, but there is an understanding and awareness of what it is to be a shepherd in a very, very personal way. Uh, it's almost as if David, as he's writing this in his mind, uh, he is remembering and thinking about his very first um, job. And so I'd love for you uh, right now um, to think back to your very first job. Now, some of you, your first job was incredible. Uh, I remember having a, a student of mine in college, didn't have a job leading up to college uh, and did some things sort of, you know, at the university, sort of, you know, working on scholarship, things like that. But their very first job, their very first sort of uh, employment, um, they actually got a job uh, at the Pentagon. They were working at the Pentagon as like a paid internship. And, and I just want to say that is a much better job than what I got um, first. What my first job was I worked um, at Converse um, Shoe Store. I worked at a Converse store, was selling um, the Chuck Taylors, the high tops, the low tops, the Jack Purcells, uh, and even for some of you that are, you know, basketball sort of fans, we were selling those Larry Johnson um, cons with the React juice in the bottom. Like, it, it was a good time. I enjoyed it as a high schooler, but I learned a lot of lessons. I learned a lot of things that I've taken with me from that employment uh, into different places. The reality is that job, there was a lot of um, things that I could critique about the job. There's a lot of things that I could complain about that job. But if I sit down and think, there were also some things that I learned and some things that I took with me from that job. Maybe for you, an exercise this week. And as you think about jobs that you've had in the past, why don't you jot down and maybe make a list of the top five, maybe the top 10 things that you've taken from pre previous seasons and previous places uh, of employment, what have you sort of drawn from? What have you gathered? And how has it informed you today? I, I think that you'll be surprised that a lot of the maybe leadership principles and leadership sort of lessons that even you're passing on to others right now, you actually maybe discovered them early on in your career and you just found yourself refining them uh, in the days and the weeks uh, that followed. You see, I think David, as we as we consider this passage, we remember that David is writing this not as a person that just has a cultural awareness of what it is to shepherd, but he actually has a personal experience as what it is to be a shepherd. You see, in the ancient Near East at that time, shepherding was one of the um, sort of predominant and one of the main earliest sort of occupations that people that they had. It was understood that it was one that wasn't just a lowly position to be a, a, a shepherd because possession, you know, of these animals were signs of wealth. You know, we see in the scriptures where it talks about how Job had a, a thousand sheep, camel, oxen, but but oftentimes, and, and maybe this is forgotten or, or not really considered, but oftentimes the owner of these flocks served as the shepherd as well. Uh, they were the keeper uh, of the sheep. And so oftentimes in scripture, we see that this is a metaphor, uh, a shepherding, or God as shepherd is a metaphor that is used uh, often in scripture. The good shepherd is, is especially concerned for the condition of the flock. And so now I want to offer you just a, a couple of, uh, of scriptures to serve as a, a reminder and kind of a window into this God as shepherd um, motif that we see uh, over and over. You see it in Revelation uh, chapter 7, verse 17, and here's how it reads, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs 
of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 11, refers to himself as the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You can know that when Jesus is, rep- like when he's referencing to his disciples that he is the good shepherd, you can know that in his mind, he is drawing back to and thinking of Psalm 23. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, he, meaning God, will tend his flock like a shepherd and he will gather the lambs in his arms and he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. In Hebrews 13, 20, it says, now be the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood and the eternal covenant. And finally, the last one, 1 Peter 5, 4, says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Over and over in the scriptures, you see God as shepherd. And I wanna offer this to you. I think for us, when we think about God as shepherd, it would be easy for us to to see this speaking of pastoral ministry, or we think of it in terms of that because those words are are where we get shepherding and we get pastoring from is right in line with this. But it would be a mistake to overlook the fact that in that time, culturally, kings, leaders, shepherds, all of these words were sort of used kind of interchangeably, if you were leading, you were shepherding. It it is to say that in the scriptures, God's way of leadership does not model often what we see in our culture today, but God's prescription, God's invitation, God's requirement is that we lead in the spirit and in the way of Jesus, the good shepherd. We see it kind of on display here in Psalm verse 23, or chapter 23, verse 1 through 3. There's some things that I want you to kind of grab hold of. There is a sort of promise of peace that we get. There's a promise of stability. There's a promise of, of sort of calm that we have here in, in this, these verses. And I want you to write down a couple of things that I, I think we can trust and see that the, the good shepherd does for us. And the first one is this, guides us. It guides us. Shepherds go first and the flock follows. It would seem very, very odd for us for a flock of sheep to be running one way and the shepherd chasing them down. That's not the way that it works. The shepherd is among, the shepherd is leading, the shepherd is guiding. The shepherd has an idea of where he's taking the sheep. He's not simply just wandering and meandering aimlessly. The shepherd goes first. I want all of us to say this, and I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say, I am not in charge. Now, how difficult was that for some of you to make that confession that you're not in charge? And the reality for us is we must understand that God as our shepherd, that he is in charge. He is leading us. He is guiding us. And we have to trust in his care. We have to trust in his ability to provide for us. We think back to all of the ways that God has guided us in the past. Come on, take a moment and do that. Think about all of the ways that God has led you and guided you right to where you are in this present time and this present place. Think about all the doors God opened. Think about the doors that God closed. Think about the opportunity. Think about the provision. Think about all of that. And if we're not careful, here's what happens. We begin to buy this lie that we are self-made, that we created all of the opportunities and we created all of the maybe wealth or the experience that we had, that we did all of those things. And I just simply want to say this to you. It was the breath in your lungs that gave you the energy to begin to do these things. And that breath was a gift of God. That breath that he has given you has guided you and it's leading you. It wasn't just you that got you here. It wasn't just you that got you here, but God has been guiding you. He's been leading you. And so we look back at what's happened historically and understand that the present and the future requires us 
to follow with obedience to the leading and the guiding of God. We must trust that our steps are ordered by God. We must trust that he is leading us and his words of caution are preserving and protecting us. I remember being a young kid and kind of inching up closer to the stove as mom was cooking and preparing a meal. This is not a unique situation for me. It's happened to kids before me. It's happened to kids after me. It'll happen all probably for the rest of time. Kids get curious and they begin to kind of touch and they begin to sort of poke around and parents give words of caution. Hey, don't touch that. It's hot. Hey, Charlie, don't touch that. It's hot. Now the warning is accurate. The word of caution precise, but if I don't heed and obey It doesn't matter. Now listen to me, friends. If we do not heed and obey the word of God, all of the promises, all of the provision, all of the caution, all of the warning that the Holy Spirit may bring our way, it doesn't matter. The warning isn't enough. We must heed and obey because the shepherd is guiding us and we can trust. We can trust his leadership. The second thing I want you to write down that we we see in this and that we can sort of trust, we have this promise of peace that God gives us. He gives it to us in his guidance. He gives it to us in the way in which God provides for us. I love how one translation says this, that the Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. There's a contentment that comes when we trust that God is our source, that God is our provision, that he is more than enough. So not only is it a reminder of our contentment, not only is is it a declaration, we are content, we're settled in God, but it is also a promise that we can declare trusting that regardless of what things look like, in seasons of plenty, I exercise contentment. In seasons of lack, I declare with this prophetic promise that God is my provision. He is my source. He is the good shepherd. And I am lacking and wanting for nothing because I know that he's going to take care of me. A friend of mine has a quote that I've said often, and I, and I love it. It says that we pray like it depends on God, but we work like it depends on us. What I want us to do in that quote is to keep in mind very, very clearly what is first and primary in that. Your work and your effort is not primary. What should precede your work, what should precede your effort is prayer and trusting in God's provision. You see, many of us, we have been working and we have been expending effort, hoping for God's provision, but we've left the most important part of that equation out where we are prayerfully trusting in God's provision. Many times we're trying to make a way without praying for God to be the way. Friends, I want us to to think about this, that The promise of God for him to not only guide us, but for him to provide for us is one that we should find rest. It's one that we should take comfort in. But we also need to be aware that the provision of God, the way in which God provides for us, changes with the seasons. It adapts with the seasons. Think about this. A shepherd doesn't care for the sheep in winter the same way that he's caring for the sheep in summer. In winter, you're looking for places where you could sort of like cuddle up and get out of the the elements. You're you're looking for a cave. You're looking for something where, where you could begin to sort of find rest and protection from the elements. When it's summer and it's hot, you're you're trying to find shade. You're trying to find the cool place. You're trying to, to find the green pastures. Listen to me. God's provision will change with the seasons. What is constant is that God will provide. 
And so sometimes we get frustrated because we expect God to provide for us in the way that he did in previous seasons. So when I'm in a new season, I get frustrated that God's not using the same method or the same methodology that he did in past seasons. And what I want us to be aware of is God's character doesn't change, but sometimes God's methods do. Sometimes God's methods of the way in which he protects and provides and guides, it is adapting to the situations that we find ourselves in. God can tailor make his provision to the place of your need. God can tailor his provision to the place of your need. I want us to have confidence that God provides for us. And he provides for us in the way that we need in the season that we're in right now. The next promise that we have, and we see in the scripture of a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Guides, provides, but also gives safekeeping. Because friends, we are exposed, just like sheep, we are exposed to attacks on all sides. We are in an open field, and there there are violence that is sort of trying to attack us from every side. Let's just give a moment and let's acknowledge that some of us have been under attack in past seasons and maybe even right now. But listen to me, the shepherd provides safekeeping. So we're aware and we have an awareness of our frailty. You see, many times I think we get frustrated because we are in need of protecting. And friend, listen to me, we are sheep and we need the shepherd to protect us. But there are times where the shepherd is going to be more confident than the sheep are going to be because the shepherd knows where they're going. The shepherd understands what is at at stake and understands the role that he's playing. But here we are, we're just terrified by the elements and we're terrified on what may be and what could be. Happen. I want you to think back to David. The Bible says that David, that there was an attack of, of a lion and a bear, oh my, and he defeated them, the Bible says, with his bare hands. Listen to me, that flock of sheep, they were terrified when the lion and the bear showed up. But I've got to think that even sheep had the ability to find a little bit of peace and comfort knowing that their shepherd was able to take care of these sort of big elements. Can also say that it does something for you in your personal leadership when you're able to lead and guide and care for people in difficult times and difficult seasons. Come on, don't you know that David, not only was he a good shepherd when he protected his flock from the danger, But he was also building some confidence in him because don't you remember when David goes to fight Goliath and he's talking with King Saul and he's letting King Saul know that, hey, listen, I don't like the way that this giant's talking and I'm fed up and the Lord's with me and I'm going to go out here and do this, that he was able to draw back on his resume as a shepherd. And he says to King Saul, he says, listen, when I was tending my father's sheep, he said, there was times when a bear came, when a lion came. And I handled my business then, so I know that I can handle business against this giant now. I I want you to see this. For you in your life, as you're leading and as you're guiding, as you're overseeing, as you're shepherding people, whether it's on your job, in your families, in your relationships, as you're caring for people, listen, as you navigate difficult seasons and situations, it's going to provide you with a confidence. It's going to provide you with a trust and an ability. And you may not have that as a sheep in the moment where you're feeling threatened. Because sometimes we don't recognize how in control of the situation the shepherd is. My youngest son, Declan, is um, just a ton of fun. Him and I, we love having fun. We've got certain things that we do. And one of the things that I I always love to do with Declan, because he's still small enough, I can, I can scoop him up and I can pick him up and I can lift him up kind of above my shoulder and his legs can be straight out and he's just like super high. The reality is this, it terrifies him. The height, the, the feeling of not being in control terrifies him. But here's the thing that I'm trying to build and instill in him. 
in this simple moment. And I go to lift him up, and he says, oh, Dad, Dad, too high, too high, too high, Dad. I'll, I'll whisper to him, hey, buddy, Dad's got you, and there's nothing you need to worry about. Dad's got you. There's nothing that you need to worry about. See, I got you. I got you. And if I've got you, nothing's going to happen to you. Some of you need to hear that from your heavenly father today. I, I know it feels like things are out of control. I know it feels like you are at risk. I know it feels like you're in the crosshairs and the enemy has a red dot on you. I, I just want to say this to you. And I hope you can hear this. Hear this not in your mind, but hear it in, in your soul. Your heavenly father, the good shepherd, he has you. He has you. And there's no height and there's no depth. There's no threat. There's nothing that is greater than the security that we find in God. You see, what you go through in the difficult season prepares you for what is ahead. It gives us the ability to trust. It gives us the ability to go, oh, we faced this in the past. We can trust that God has us in the future. The final thing I want you to write down today that we can sort of take, take to heart is that there's a responsibility for us, the sheep, in all this as well. You see, we, we walk through the sort of the, the guiding, the providing, the safekeeping. That's what the shepherd does for us. Now, here's what we are to do in this, and it's to simply do this, to make it personal. The very first line of what we read today, the Lord is my shepherd. It's personal. Reading through in a Bible reading plan right now and just getting through Genesis. It's just interesting to me when you see the stories of, of Abraham's descendants, where, where you see Jacob, where he'll make statements over and over, the God of my fathers. There's a sense for a lot of Jacob's life, it seems as if he was holding on to the religion of the patriarchy. He was holding on to the religion of his relatives. It hadn't become personal to him, but after he has the encounter and the wrestling with God, it changes not only his name, not only the way that he walks, but it now turns into the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not just the God of my forefathers, but it's, it's my God. There's a personal sort of embrace of God. It's what you and I have to have. As, as young kids would be taught the Torah, rabbis would, would teach it this way. They would open the Bible, and as they would begin to, to read the, the very first line of Scripture, in the beginning, God, they would stop the teaching at that place. And they would say that the rest of this, the rest of Torah, the rest of Genesis, the rest of all of this, it's going to be very, very difficult, very, very difficult for us to interact with, to comprehend, to receive, if we haven't resolved in the beginning, God. And friends, you and I will miss out on the provision and the promise and the peace and the blessing that we find in Psalm 23 if we do not have the ability to declare the Lord is my shepherd. That it is a personal experience. Not a private experience, but a personal one, meaning that I have encountered it. I know this to be true. I'm embracing this with my life. And here's some ways that we do it. One, we exercise confidence in the shepherd. We trust. We trust the shepherd. The second is that we, we grow in our love of the shepherd. Think about it like this. Any of you that are, that are pet owners, I've got a, a ferocious, we've got a ferocious dog at our house. It's a, it's a giant, giant, giant guard dog. Uh, it, it's a it's a mini it's a mini golden doodle. It is far from a guard dog, but but this but this dog this dog loves me. I'm not gonna lie to you. This dog loves me. Has a deep affection for me. And I've got a deep affection for that dog. But here's the thing: the affection that our dog Wrigley has for for us as a family is far greater now than it was the first night that we brought him home. It's the love, the affection, that relationship. It has grown. So when I say things like we have to love. The shepherd, we have to have a love for God. That love for God should be growing. It should be increasing. And friend, I'm just saying, that is something that you have to make the decision and the choice on the days when it's clear and in the moments when you don't feel like it. 
That's when you choose to grow in, in your love for the shepherd. We follow the shepherd. We follow the shepherd. And then finally, we lead in the way of the shepherd. It's not enough, friends, for us just to simply follow the way of Jesus, but we must also lead in the way of, lead, uh, of Jesus. Any good leader, I think, is a good follower first. So in your families, in your personal life, on your jobs, in your businesses, with your colleagues, on the committees you serve, lead in the way of the good shepherd. And as we walk through this passage over the next few weeks, my prayer is that you would continue to see and know the shepherd that promises goodness and mercy to pursue you and chase after you is able to be trusted and depended because this is also the same shepherding voice that declared over your life, you're okay, I can find a place of rest for you, I've got guidance, provision, and safety here for you. And a God that does that is a God that you and I can trust and a God that you and I are called to know deeply. Grace and peace, friends. We love you so much. Well, church, what an incredible sermon that we just heard on Psalm 23. And I love the, the invitation that God gives up to us where he invites us uh, to still waters and where he wants to restore our souls. And church, that invitation stands for you today where God wants to invite you on that journey. Wherever you may find yourself, uh, today is a day that you can accept that invitation that God gives to you. And church, always remember that we are here for you as your church family. Whatever we can do, let us know. We are praying for you, and we hope that you have an incredible week.